Hi everyone, Professor King here. Sorry, I just scared my dog. That's why my screen shook like that when I said hello. Um, in this video, I'm gonna be talking about um, Kimberly Crenshaw's article, Mapping the Margins. One thing I wanna discuss um, or that I wanna remind you before we get into the discussion, is uh, the, the page numbers for the reading. You don't have to read all 60 pages. I'm mean, but I'm not that mean. Um, the pages you have to read are the introduction and part one uh, beginning structural intersectionality from pages 1241 to 1250. And those are in the upper right hand corner of the PDF. Uh, the beginning of part two, uh, political intersectionality that goes from pages 1251 to 1252. Um, the beginning of part three, representational intersection and intersectionality that goes from pages 1282 to 1283 and the conclusion which starts at 1296 and goes until the end. So that's really only about like uh, 15 pages or so, um, maybe slightly more than that, but much more digestible, much easier than 60. So um, that will also be on the announcement. It'll, it should also be, um, stated on the link itself. So just, be aware of that. Um, okay, so we're going to get started here. So I'll take it to a share screen because I feel like my, um, honestly, my video quality just gets worse and worse. And this is a brand new laptop, which makes me very, very sad. Um, and before I take it to a share screen, just so you can all see what I'm working with here. This is Coleslaw. Coleslaw, say hi to everyone. That's her. That's the one who just shook my laptop the moment I started this uh, web teach. So, um, hi. If you see if it shakes a little bit more, that's going to be it's going to be on this little lady here. Um, all right. So let me take it to a share screen really quickly. She's going underneath the blanket. That's what she likes to do. There we go. Okay. Should be okay now. All right, and I will. All right, so this is um, Kimberly Crenshaw's Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. Um, and that's Kimberly Crenshaw right there, the uh, writer of this piece. And the person who actually coined the term intersectionality. I know this is a term that has been bounced around a lot in the last few years, particularly when we've um, seen movements such as hashtag me too and um, Black Lives Matter and things like that. And a lot of people, you know, throw this term around very loosely, but it has very specific meaning. And I want to make sure we're all understanding what that is, because there is a very complex and rich sociological framework um, that this term is a part of. And so, you know, a lot of times these these ideas become academic buzzwords and kind of uh, their meaning becomes diluted. So one of the reasons why I wanted to share this piece specifically is um, so that we know what we're dealing with, right? And we're not just kind of using a term that we think we know uh, to, to um, to talk about things in, in superficial ways, because, you know, we don't want to be superficial. We want to be academics. Anyway, so let's go to defining intersectionality first, right? Um, so it deals with how people are disadvantaged, you, usually, right? It starts with the idea of identity markers. And by identity markers, we're talking about all the different major attributes uh, by which we identify, right? Gender, race, class, ability status, age, ethnicity, country of origin, language, level of education, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, and not in this reading, but in a much later interview in 2017, um, you know, Crenshaw was asked to kind of, of course, give like a, a one to two sentence description because that's what everybody wants. Nobody wants to do like rigorous work anymore. We all want like a blurb, um, which is unfortunate. But she was asked in an interview kind of to define it and talk about it. And so she said in this interview with Columbia Law 
that intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects, much like we see in this image here, and, it, and how that affects the individual, right, who is experiencing those particular identities. Oh, could I have my water? Thank goodness, I was already starting to feel my throat dry up. Um, it's not simply that there is a race problem here, a gender problem there, um, a class or LGBTQ problem there. Many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. And we'll talk more about what that means in a moment. But essentially, essentially, um, what we're dealing with is a response to essentialism. But other theorists that we've already looked at, right, like Foucault and others, Said. Um, that they want to push against. And Foucault and Said are, um, you know, applying it to literature, applying it to theory, applying it to philosophy. Crenshaw is, is applying it to sociology, but from this work that she does, uh, you know, intersectionality kind of explodes on the scene and we can then apply it to literature. So <clears throat> she she breaks down three different um, components, structural, political, and representational intersectionality. Um, so we'll kind of briefly go over each one. Um, and then, um, you know, then she concludes it. And unfortunately, dang it, this quote cut off because this was a really good quote, um, but I'll explain it anyway. Um, so with structural inter intersectionality, we're looking at how institutions, you know, broad institutions um, and societal structures affect an individual of intersecting identities negatively, okay? Um, <clears throat> and the, the, the example that she uses is um, the, you know, and this was not um, just briefly the part that you had to read was the 1990 amending of the Immigration and Nationality Act because that act said that, um, you know, if you were an immigrant and you married um, a citizen or a naturalized citizen in the United States, you had to stay married to that person for at least two years before you could divorce because otherwise you could run the risk of being deported because they were trying to, um, eliminate fraud, right, in these uh, immigration uh, marriages, which sounds fine, if, you know, on the surface level, but when we're talking about the ways in which people are oppressed based on specific identity markers, we start to see problems with that, because as we know, if someone um, is female, right, or if someone... <coughs> expresses as a woman, um, identifies as a woman, they're more likely to experience um, issues with domestic violence, with sexual violence, uh, with various types of domestic abuse, right, um, than say their male counterparts. Um, but also if we're thinking about someone who is an immigrant, they have the added issue oftentimes of language barriers or of economic dependency on their spouses. So the amending of this act was to address and identify these intersectional um, issues, right? These intersectional oppressions, because if we're only looking at the fraud, then that makes it worse for say a woman who has immigrated to the United States, but her spouse, um, you know, um, is 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 violently abusive to her. Um, but she, you know, then she has nowhere to go because she may not have the economic means to leave. She may not have access to the um, to the language of the country she's in. Right. So that's where we start to see again how these various identity intersections make things more and more difficult, right? The further from power, the, you know, the more identity markers that person has and the more of those identity markers that keep them from power, right? From power and privilege. So that's sort of a structural intersection and intersectionality in a nutshell. And this quote says, you know, 
Um, when immigrant women are often trapped in abusive relationships because of immigration laws, language barriers, socialized because of so immigration laws, language barriers, social isolation, and lack of financial resources, right? So it's not just one thing, in other words, and these, these people don't exist like in a vacuum, right? Um, they're often experiencing these multiple sort of uh, oppressions, abuses of power, marginalizations, et cetera. Next, we have political intersectionality. And I'm just going to share these quotes really sum up what what um, what Crenshaw is is kind of uh, not just premising but getting at in this section. Um, she says because women of color experience racism in ways not always the same as those experienced by men of color, and sexism in ways not always parallel to experiences of white women anti-racism and feminism are limited even on their own terms okay and so think about that like if we think about like hashtag me too how many of the major stories that we heard um were were of of white women right um and that's not to diminish the fact that what those women experienced was horrific However, right, the person who, who starts me to is Tarana Burke, who is a woman of color. And, um, you know, even sh her, her um, you know, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, you know, and so we focus on the issues of white women. And the political problem with that is then if we're focusing on the issues of white women, we do not see, right, again, the, the, the the ways in which women of color are affected um, differently and oftentimes worse um, because of again their multiple identity markers beyond just gender right um, and the same thing with if we think about um, the recent protests right um, you know we have we have some of the discussion of Breonna Taylor but a lot of the discussions that we're looking on um, in terms of uh, race and police brutality focus on men, right? So that kind of takes away from the ways in which um, women of color, right? Women of color of particular socioeconomic statuses and, um, you know, again, all these different identity markers are further hurt by these things when they are, when they are ignored, right? When they're ignored from these conversations, when their, you know, intersectional identities are not addressed. In other words, when essentialism, um, makes it so that so that these these um these issues aren't addressed and this gets to the second quote where uh crenshaw says the failure of feminism to interrogate race means that the resistance strategies of feminism will often replicate and reinforce the subordination of people of color and the failure of anti-racism to interrogate patriarchy means that anti-racism will frequently reproduce the subordination of women Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit, right? The first one, right, is kind of building on what I was just talking about, right? Like with the Me Too and everything. Um, so how does not bringing race into the conversation of feminism or ability status or class or sexual orientation, how does that make things worse for people who um, experience identity markers um, related to those particular, you know, characteristics, how does it make things worse for people who are far from power, right? Well, if they're ignored, right, if they're not kind of gathered into that conversation, then we never address the issues that they have to face, right? We kind of stop at, you know, um, wealthy, straight, white, able-bodied women and that excludes a whole number of people, right? Cis hetero women, sorry, I forgot to add that. Um, and same thing on the other end with what Crenshaw is talking about with race, right? Um, if we're only focusing on um, men of color, right? Then that is, ex you know, straight cis hetero, you know, middle-class or above men of color particularly, then how, then the exclusion of people who don't fit that mold um, causes them to be further oppressed is kind of the, the easiest way of saying it. And for this second quote, the, the one in green at the bottom here, um, she, 
this is the part that you didn't have to read. Maybe some of you did, but she goes into this um, discussion of Mike Tyson. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, Mike Tyson was a very famous pugilist, which is another word for boxer um, in the late eighties, early nineties, you know, he was in the hangover movies. Now he's kind of become like, no pun intended, but he's become his own punchline, right? Like he's got the face tattoo and people make fun of his lisp. First of all, don't ever make fun of people with lisps because it's not cool. But, you know, um, the problem with, with that, anyway, the problem that Crenshaw points out is, um, you know, when, when people like Louis Farrakhan were coming to his aid, they for, for, by the way, for, for domestic battery, he was, he was violent with a number of women of color, um, in the eighties and nineties and probably, well, I won't say probably beyond, I don't want to, I don't want to assume anything, but, um, there were reported cases of him being very violent with, with several women, um, of color. And so when, when people like Louis Farrakhan would come to his defense, they would use, um, the sort of discussions of oppression taken from, from these discussions around women of color, but apply that to him. But the problem was, right, he was abusive and violent towards these women of color and these women of color were never mentioned. And so again, they're sort of ignored. They're left out of the conversation or Crenshaw says, they're even ridiculed or um, scorn, you know, become the, the, the subject of scorn, right? How many times have you um, heard people say like hor horrific things about survivors of abuse, like they're lying or they're inflating their um, statistics or, you know, just very victim blaming sort of language like that. And what Crenshaw says is the reason for that is because again, we're only looking at one identity marker, which is race. We're not looking at gender. We're not looking at all of these other things that play into these women being abused and being further oppressed and being ignored, right? So that's um, her example that she uses for political intersectionality. And, you know, you, you may be thinking like, well, Mike Tyson, why political? It's because of all these sort of political figures and these political, I don't want to say movements, but I guess like mini movements that came to his aid, right? When he was accused of these things. All right. The last one is representational intersectionality. Um, and I just kind of pulled some quotes from representational intersectionality from the section you had to read. Um, she says when, Crenshaw says, when one discourse fails to acknowledge the significance of the other, the power relations that each attempts to challenge are strengthened. And I'm sorry, hold on. I always do this with quotation marks. I don't know why. I'm just a wild, too wild. Um, so in other words, if we don't look at things intersectionally, if we only utilize these essentialist sort of one category lenses, we're actually making things worse. If we're not sitting within the complexity of, of these identities, of these conversations, of these issues, right? We're making things worse. And again, this is another one where I'm just like, right? Like when we think about the stuff going on today and how we treat, um, you know, specific groups as if they're like monolithic and then all of the variety of, of identities and experiences within that group just become lumped into this one, how problematic that becomes. And not only problematic, but again, how many of those diverse identities are just ignored or um, again, ridiculed or scorned or whatever, because they don't conform to this very stereotypical essentialist model that we, we've created this, this path pattern, this category that we've created. Um, and this particularly in this discussion, right, she's talking about representation and the reproduction of racial and gender hierarchy in the United States, right? So what we see in media, film, books, et cetera, et cetera, is 
is is upholding that hierarchy, right? Is keeping that together, especially when it's limited, right? Um, she says representation, representational intersectionality would include. So she's saying, how do we respond to this? How do we how do we address this problem? Um, it would include both the ways in which these images are produced through a confluence of prevalent narratives of race and gender, as well as a recognition of how contemporary critiques of racist and sexist representation marginalize women of color. Okay. Um, so again, it's all about expand creating a space or if it's already there expanding the space for complexity and in this case it's a complexity of identities right it's it's a complexity of um even affiliations right um and why why again because if we don't we're just making things worse we're just reinforcing the racial and gender and class and ability hierarchies and you know um and the example again that she uses that we didn't that I didn't have you read about it, um, because this is written in 1991. She's these these issues she's talking about in this article um, are actually very contemporary for her for when she's writing this. Right? It may seem a little, you know, it may seem antiquated now, but it's really not. Right? Like a lot of these issues are still going on, if not all of them. Um, but anyway, the example she uses is Two Life Crew. And she talks about how, you know, in their videos, they, you know, they, they, and, and a lot of these rappers of this time are doing the same thing, right? Even like Tupac and Biggie and all of these guys, right? They're Dr. Dre, especially, right? He's, I mean, he's just a, a very well-known domestic abuser. He's, he's, he threw D Barnes down a hallway, but, um, they, they, you know, on the one hand, they're talking about the struggles of the black experience. They're talking about, um, you know, they're sort of elevating also the black experience. Um, but at the same time, they're degrading women of color in their videos, right? They, they, you know, even, even later on when you have people like Kanye and I mean, a lot of, a lot of, and, and this is not only rappers, right? Like, any number of rock and roll bands do this too. But you have on the one hand, this discussion of like how difficult the black experience is. But on the other hand, then you'll have songs like, um, you know, um, Me So Honey, which was, which was Two Life Crew or with Tupac, he had my, I Get Around, right? Which just are horrifically degrading to women of color. And so what Crenshaw says is like stuff like that, right? if we think about audience and we think about purpose and we think about um, the people who are creating these representations, not just the artists themselves, but you know, the people in the media studios, the directors of the videos, like whom does this serve? I, I feel like I've asked this question to you before and I always ask people this to ask themselves this question because it's a great cornerstone critical thought question, great analysis question. Whom does this representation serve? If I, you know, if I as a white woman am on the cover of Vanity Fair, and it says hashtag Me Too, and everybody else on the cover looks exactly like me, right? Um, whom does that serve? Whose interest does that serve? Whose interest does it not serve? Who is left out of that conversation, right? And in the same vein, right? If I as a rapper am talking about the, you know, the, the very obvious and difficult challenges of living as a black man in America, but I'm also showing a bunch of, you know, women in bikinis and calling them bitches and hoes and gold diggers and, you know, everything else, whom does that serve? Whom does it not serve? And so we have to think about this, especially when we think about rep representation, because so much of our culture is a visual, is a media driven culture. And these images that we're constantly inundated with are affecting the way that we perceive reality to be.
Um, okay, I'll move on. <clears throat> so in the conclusion, right, um, we're essentially getting, essentially, right, every time, now that the words in my head, I'll just keep repeating it. We're getting to these points that the, the problem, right, beyond all the problems of power and, and oppression and hierarchy, at the root of these is the problem of categorization, right? Because it has consequences. It's a tool for maintaining power structures and subordinating certain individuals. And we gotta think about this really quickly because our brains are hardwired to categorize, right? If, um, you know, if, if somebody, I don't know, like if a teacher was crummy to you, right? And that teacher looks a certain way or talks with a certain affect or teaches a certain subject, right? Your adaptation response, right? Is to perhaps avoid that subject or avoid school altogether or avoid teachers who remind you of that person because it's categorization, right? It's saying, I am, I'm applying this to this group because of this experience and I will tread thusly after, after understanding that, right? And Crenshaw says, we have to go beyond that because when we talk about it in terms of identity, in terms of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, you know, uh, ability, status, et cetera, it becomes a tool for maintaining power structures and subordinating certain individuals in the ways that we've just talked about, right? And beyond. And so she says, we have to reconceptualize identity by challenging our impulse to categorize. It's really, really hard to do so. I mean, I know no one wants to, but like, look at the political conversations that are going on on social media right now this group is all idiots and this group is, you know, my group is so smart and, you know, it's this very essentialist sort of rhetoric that we're seeing because again, the object of Google, the object of social media, the object of TikTok, Facebook, Instagram is not complex thought or discussion. That requires a lot of space. It requires a lot of words. It requires a lot of pages. Um, and people who are making money off of you clicking onto those social media sites don't want you to think critically. They want you to click, 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 click so that they can, you know, generate more revenue through ads and clickbait and all these things, right? So, so much of our culture now is dictated by um, these essentialist categorizations. These, all of this means that, these either or fallacies and people people aren't like that and as crenshaw points out right if if we do that if we succumb to that sort of black or white thinking no pun intended um we only make things worse for all of the you know all the people who fall within the gray right um which is most of us and so we have to reconceptualize identity by challenging the impulse to categorize, right? You know, <clears throat> even if we think about the Karen phenomenon, and I, I will be the first to say, right? Like, I think that behavior, you know, that is associated with the Karen stereotype is abhorrent, right? Like it's awful. However, right, if we start to talk about, um, you know, all white women as sort of being a Karen, then those white women who um, live in poverty, right, who um, are um, survivors or, or experiences of abuse, right, who, um, who live with a disability, right, et cetera, who are queer, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera we've erased all of that and just said like, screw these Karens. And that becomes a problem, right? Um, we have to look at things with more complexity. Um, and that's really another major cornerstone of critical thought. Um, and finally, you know, identity groups are not categories. 
their coalitions, right? And not just within the individual, but among individuals. If we look at these identity groups as coalitions, in other words, like, you know, even though I'm just, and this terrifies me, but even though I'm as much of a white woman as Ann Coulter is, um, there's, there's diversity there, right? Um, you know, even though I am as much of a woman as Brianna Taylor was, the experience that she experienced because of her race, the overwhelming odds are I would not have, have, have had to experience, have had to die, right? Because of my race. Um, so if, but so if, if we just categorized us both as women, that would delete that narrative, right? That very painful narrative that our, our culture has to confront. But if we considered the way of, you know, if we consider that we are both women, but that she has a very different, you know, that she had a very different life experience than me um, and can sit with that and honor that and acknowledge that and reconceptualize identity and how we interact with one another based on that, that's where the change needs to happen, right? Um, all right, so now let's think about this in terms of the novel. So, you know, this is another cute little infographic of like intersectionality. It's a little bit different than the first one because now instead of thinking about one individual, we're thinking about groups, right? And, and group interactions and how these, how these identities bounce off one another, right? And how they, they change or affect one another when, when one of them changes. So um, here's what I want you to think about, right? Like we've, we've been introduced to so many cool characters in this novel. We're almost at the end, right? And we've, we've gotten so many cool characters and we've, you know, we've got Ava Luna, we've got Elva, Elvira, right, or Elvira, we've got Huberto uh, Naranja, we've got pff, Mimi, we've got the general, Rolf Carley, Riyad Halabi, Sulema, Kamal, um, you know, even minor characters like Katarina, um, Joe Ken or Joe Shen, um, you know, we've got all these, this rich tapestry of characters going on and very different characters. Um, so what I want you to, 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 you know, maybe you want to pause this and do this right now is I want you to think about a character that we've met thus far in the novel. And it, it's, it's a really good idea to go back to your highlights, your underlines, your notes, and think about how that character is described, not just physically, but emotionally in terms of personality, behavior, um, their trajectory is not the right word. What am I thinking of? Their arc, their, you know, their arc throughout the novel. Um, how other characters, particularly uh, Ava, interact with them, right? Like um, just jot down, you know, either brainstorm or in your mind, like all of the things you can remember in terms of that character. And then with the same character in mind, here's what I want you to do. Once you've done that kind of, you know, five minute brainstorm or whatever, I want you to change at least three of their identity markers. In other words, if they're male, you know, um, you can make them uh, gender non-conforming, right? Or gender fluid or female or, you know, whatever, right? Um, if they're rich, make them poor. If they're, um, you know, from Europe, think about what it would be like if they were from South America. Um, and then with those three changes, those three identity marker changes, I want you to think about how that character would have changed um, in the ways you described from this first bullet point here, right, um, up top how they would have changed if those identity markers were different. Would they be treated differently throughout the novel? Would their arc in the story change? 
you know, would their behavior change? Would the, you know, would their role in the novel change? Like really think about like, how would this novel change if, if we can, you know, if we played around with this notion of intersectionality and then think about what that says, if we don't just change one identity marker, but we change multiples, how many changes do we see within each individual character? And then finally, if you've read ahead, or even if you haven't, because there's a little bit of, dis of discussion about it in chapter 10, which is where we we're up to at this point. Um, think of the film that's made. And then, you know, Ava Luna writes this script and she and Rolf kind of collaborate and Aravena is talking to her about the, you know, tell this story, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the story is told. Um, how do we see representational intersectionality either at work or being challenged with that story, with Ava, essentially the story that Ava Luna is telling? um through film through the script um all right so that is i've been playing with my hair a lot in this video i think i'm tired um that's that for these questions for this for this web teach um as always if you have questions comments or concerns please feel free to contact me um email canvas zoom you know that you know the drill at this point um all right well i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening and day and um i will see you in cyberspace